Hello everyone. This presentation is a slightly condensed version of the regular introduction which I give as part of the Tribology course. This course is intended for engineers who have encountered practical friction and wear problems and want to learn how to solve them. It is equally intended for active researchers in surface science, coatings research, materials testing and product development. Tribology is a truly interdisciplinary science and must therefore be treated as one. Many engineers are unprepared for solving tribological problems because they only see one side of the problem. For example, a mechanical engineer may understand the mechanics of a contact, but not the potential chemical interactions that may occur, nor the potential for lowering friction by the addition of a lubricant. Also, most undergraduate engineering courses often neglect tribology or only cover the subject very briefly. This does not help graduates to gain the tools necessary to solve real-world tribological problems. So the objectives of this course are threefold. One, understand the basics of tribology as well as the historical evolution. Two, recognize the most common modes of wear. And three, to gain a knowledge of the main tribology testing methods as well as which method is best suitable for a particular application. At the end of this course, the attendee will have a solid understanding of basic tribology principles, test methods, and will, have a, and will have gained a valuable starting point for solving real world tribological problems. So just a few words about myself, your lecturer. I'm a chartered engineer from the Institute of Materials in the UK. I gained a Bachelor of Science in Materials Science from Brunel University in London in 94 and a PhD from Neuchâtel University in Switzerland in 97. I've been an active tribologist since studying nanoscale tribological phenomena during my PhD thesis. I then joined CSM Instruments in 97, a manufacturer of both macroscale and small scale tribology testing equipment. During my time with CSM Instruments, 97 to 2013, I served as customer services manager and then VP business development while setting up the US subsidiary. I was then lead scientist with Anton Parr Tritech following the acquisition of CSM Instruments by Anton Parr in 2013. I'm currently VP business development with Alemnis, a company specialized in in situ tribological testing. Now let's look at a typical outline of the two day course program. This course begins with the basics of surface topography and contact mechanics, as well as fundamental concepts of deformation at different scales. This is followed by a focus on the different modes of friction and wear that may be encountered with emphasis on adhesive and abrasive erosive wear, ceramics wear, polymer wear and coatings wear. Two sessions are dedicated to the design of tribological tests the instrument configurations currently available and the best ways to interpret test data. Depending on the location of the course, we try to incorporate a lab tour in the local tribology lab if appropriate. For example, when we hold the course in Arus, we typically make a guided tour of the tribology lab at the Danish Technological Institute. OK, so let's now delve a bit deeper into the historical background to tribology and what has been done previously to get us to where we are today. Tribology is defined as the science and technology of interacting surfaces in relative motion. It is derived from the Greek word tribos, which literally means rubbing. It therefore encompasses the study of friction, wear and lubrication between surfaces in contact and the interactions at their interface. Such interactions may be the transmission of forces, the conversion of mechanical energy, the chemistry of the surfaces, or the interlocking phenomena related to surface morphology and topography. The basic essence of tribology is to understand these surface interactions and thus be able to solve problems and find adequate solutions. The term tribology became widely used following the Jost report published in 1966. The report highlighted the huge cost of friction, wear and corrosion to the UK economy roughly 1.1 to 1.4 percent of GDP. As a result, the UK government established several national centres to address tribological problems. Since then, the term has diffused into the international community, with many specialists now identifying as tribologists. Despite considerable research since the Jost report, 
the global impact of friction and wear on energy consumption, economic, economic expenditure and carbon dioxide emissions are still considerable. In 2017, Ken Holmberg and Ali Erdemir attempted to quantify their impact worldwide. In a paper published in the journal Friction, they considered the four main energy consuming sectors, transport, manufacturing, power and generation and residential. Their conclusions suggested that in total, about 23% of the world's energy consumption originates from tribological contacts. Of that, 20% is to overcome friction and 3% to remanufacture worn parts and spare equipment due to wear and wear related issues. By taking advantage of new technologies for friction reduction and wear protection, energy losses due to friction and wear in vehicles, machinery and other equipment worldwide could be reduced by 40% in the long term and 18% in the short term. On a global scale, these savings would amount to 1.4% of GDP annually and 8.7% of total energy consumption in the long term. The largest short-term energy savings are envisioned in transport 25% and in power generation 20%, while the potential savings in the manufacturing and residential sectors are estimated to be about 10%. In the longer term, savings could be much greater depending on the technologies adopted. Classical tribology covering such applications as ball bearings, gear drives, clutches, brakes, etc. was developed in the context of mechanical engineering. But in the last decades, tribology has expanded to qualitatively new fields of applications, in particular micro and nanotechnology, as well as biology and medicine. Although the term tribology was invented approximately 450 years after Leonardo da Vinci, he was the first one to perform a systematic study on friction, and his sketches are widely known among tribologists. They show many experiments using wooden blocks in sliding contact, Leonardo not only understood but also applied the fundamental laws of friction to the solution of practical problems. His understanding of friction included the appreciation of the influence of the materials and the lubrication state on the friction coefficient. In addition to Leonardo da Vinci's work, we can also find much earlier examples of tribological problem solving, such as adding animal fat to early wheel bearings to reduce friction or grinding cereals with wheels incorporating solid bearings. You can see a nice example of early Egyptian use of lubricants in the picture shown here. This red circle shows a man at the front of the pharaoh's sledge pouring a liquid under the runners to make them slide easier. So we have three important historical contributions to the theory of tribology. Leonardo da Vinci first introduced the concept of a friction coefficient as the ratio of the lateral force to the normal load. Guillaume Amantens postulated that frictional force is directly proportional to the applied load and that frictional force is independent of apparent contact area. Coulomb then distinguished between static and dynamic friction and found that frictional force is independent of sliding speed once relative motion begins, at least over a certain range of speed. Many additional, co additional contributions were made during the Industrial Revolution, including Robert Hooke, who suggested steel sleeves for wheel bearings, and Isaac Newton, who developed the basic laws of viscous flow, although the science behind lubrication developed much later. Hydrodynamic lubrication was first discovered in England by Beauchamp Tower in 1883. He used a specially constructed test rig for journal bearings, simulating the conditions found in railway axle boxes. In order to achieve consistent results, the majority of Tower's investigations were carried out with the shaft immersed in an oil bath. Tower investigated the influence of lubrication on friction at a high sliding velocity. Like other researchers, he found that the friction coefficient strongly varied with the load and velocity, contrary to what Coulomb had formulated. Dependent on the rotational velocity, a very low friction coefficient of less than 0.01 was found. Two years later, Osborne Reynolds in 1886 published a differential equation describing the pressure buildup in the oil film, but it took still many years before this equation was solved for journal bearings. So to summarize, we can say that tribology is defined as the science and technology of interacting surfaces in relative motion, and that tribology embraces the study of friction, wear, and lubrication. 
OK, so let's look at some modern examples of why we want to solve tribological problems. This is a friend of mine, Damien André, who holds the current world speed record for street luge. Although he has already achieved over 100 miles per hour, he always wants to go just that little bit faster. One way to do this is to simulate the aerodynamics in a wind tunnel, as you can see here. This allows the shape of the luge to be optimised, as well as the helmet and clothing. Another avenue is experimenting with different bearings and lubricants. Another tribological problem which we are continuously trying to improve is the internal combustion engine. One of the few remaining solutions to reduce fuel consumption is to reduce friction and wear between mating surfaces in the engine. This might be by applying low friction coatings on components, such as the diamond-like carbon coatings shown here, or by improving the efficiency of lubricants. Here is an example of tribology solving in the watchmaking or horological field. Many modern watch and clock movements still wear out after a number of years of continual service, especially when lubricants break down and no longer perform their intended purpose. The lever escapement, which is used in the vast majority of watches, was invented some 250 years ago by Thomas Mudge, and although it has been adopted universally, it has one fundamental flaw. It requires oil. Its sliding friction makes optimal lubrication crucial, which compromises the stability of the watch rate over time. An English clockmaker, George Daniels, developed the coaxial escapement, which functions with a system of three pallets that separate the locking function from the impulse with the pushing, as opposed to the sliding friction of the lever escapement, resulting in greater mechanical efficiency. The critical virtue of this escapement is the virtual elimination of all sliding friction, theoretically resulting in greater accuracy over time and longer service intervals. The direct impulse to the roller of the balance by the teeth of the escapement wheel means greater mechanical efficiency, hence more stable precision. This escapement has now been commercialised by Omega in Switzerland since the 90s. An interesting little anecdote to this story is that Daniels developed his escapement at his home on the Isle of Man, which has an average year-round humidity of 75-90%. to 90%. Here, the escapement worked flawlessly. However, when he sold his invention to Omega in Switzerland, where the humidity can be lower than 50% in the winter, they found that the escapement could stop running under certain conditions. So in the end, they decided to still lubricate it to prevent such stoppages. So this just shows how even slight changes in the, in the environment can affect tribological contacts. We also have other innovative tribology solutions in the horological field. Here you can see John Harrison's long case regulator clock, which is made almost entirely of wood. Harrison was a carpenter by trade and therefore knew that a certain wood from South America called lignum vitae was so naturally oily that it could be used against other materials without any additional lubricant. His clock, built in 1717, achieved a previously unheard of precision of about one second per month, a really outstanding achievement. He went on to win the prize for measuring longitude at sea using a timekeeper and subsequently invented the marine chronometer, which has prevented many shipwrecks over the years due to captains not knowing their position at sea accurately. So in this course, we will begin by focusing some time on how to understand surfaces and their structure. This is because all tribological inter interactions occur between two mating surfaces. So an understanding of these surface properties is fundamental if we want to understand how they will perform in a tribological context. We will cover the basic surface roughness parameters and how best to measure and interpret them. We will also look at the measurement of important surface properties, including hardness, elastic modulus, creep, stress relaxation, as well as their influence on contact mechanics. We will also focus on how to understand a specific surface at the scale at which it will be used. We will consider previous processing steps such as fabrication and polishing and environmental effects such as oxidation or contamination on the surface properties. You cannot understand tribology if you do not know your surfaces in sufficient detail, especially in terms of their mechanical, chemical, thermal and topographical properties. Here's a typical example of a complicated surface, the hard drive of your computer. During normal operation when the PC is switched on, 
the read-write head of the drive is separated from the disc by a layer of air, known as an air bearing, meaning that they do not come into contact and so wear is non-existent. However, when you start or switch off your computer, the read-write head lands on the disc surface and it is this contact which eventually causes catastrophic wear and damage, which can remove areas where data is recorded. The problem is CASI solved by applying a very thin lubricant layer to the surface to lower friction during spin up and spin down. The basic theory of friction starts with the definition of the coefficient of friction. This is defined as the ratio of the lateral or tangential force Ft to the, the applied normal force Fn. This is commonly known as Amonton's law, even though we now know that Leonardo da Vinci had already proved it many years previously. Although the friction coefficient describes the sliding resistance between two surfaces under specific conditions, it does not tell us anything about the wear resistance of those materials in contact. The wear resistance is rather complicated and cannot be considered as a material's property. It will depend on a whole host of factors, including the contact geometry, sliding speed, surface roughness, and the material properties themselves, the operation environment and temperature. We will focus later in the course on the application of surface coatings to improve functionality whilst providing suitable aesthetic qualities. The use of coatings to improve tribological contacts is now established throughout many industries, where they can be utilized to change the coefficient of friction, reduce or prevent wear, and improve lubrication. We will spend some time trying to understand the most important surface mechanical properties, how best to measure them, and how they relate to tribological properties. This will be done in the context of tribological use, and will thus incorporate the effects of roughness topography and coating thickness. Here we see the most common surface characterization methods and the effective depth to which they can measure. So the choice of method will be directly related to the scale of the tribological interaction envisaged. Here we see a modern diamond-like carbon coating developed to reduce friction and wear. Although the coating performs incredibly well, we may still have issues with the adhesion of the coating on certain substrates. Here we see good adhesion on silicon or glass, but poor adhesion on the brass surface to be used in our industrial application. So developing a great coating only works if you're able to apply it to the surface of interest, so that it becomes an integral component that can extend the overall lifetime. The sessions on tribological testing will focus on the most common test methods. Here are a few examples. The ball on disc and pin on disc A and B, the four ball wear tester geometry in C, the block on ring D, the plate on plate E, and the pin on V block in F. All of these will be covered in some detail. Some time will be spent during this course thinking about subjectivity in tribology testing. Here's an example of friction coefficients recorded in literature for a steel on steel contact. You can see the incredible variations depending on test method, test conditions, and measurement technology. A VAMAS round-robin study back in 1987 showed that reproducibility between different labs, testing the exact same material pair, could record variations in friction up to 20% and in wear up to almost 40%. Here you can see the actual data from that study. The standard deviation between the 39 labs that participated was almost 20%. Much of the variation was thought to be due to different environmental conditions in the different countries that participated, but it just goes to show the difficulties in getting to truly reproducible test procedures. Well, I hope these introductory slides have given you a taste of what this course is all about, and I hope that you may choose to join us on one of the forthcoming course dates which are listed on the website. Thanks for listening and hope to see you soon.